Welcome to the No Bibs, Burps, Bottles podcast, where we highlight and share the stories of African American women who are 30 plus, child free, wonderfully made, and living their best life. Remember, womanhood is not synonymous with motherhood. This is Dr. Angela L. Harris, your host. Come join me as we get comfortable and cozy with no bibs, no burps, no bottles. Stay tuned. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Angela L. Harris. I'm the host and visionary of No Bibs, Burps, Bottles, and I welcome you to today's podcast episode. I want to thank everyone for listening and supporting our podcast, and I'm so excited to have two sisters who are going to share with you their child-free journey, their experiences, and then they're going to share a little bit more about how you can follow them and connect with them at the end of our interview today. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into it, and I know about these sisters because I've been following them on their social media and we share the same career interests in regards to mental health, but I'm going to ask each one of them to introduce themselves, share what they they do, share a little bit about themselves, and then we're going to jump right into their child-free journey and story. So which one of you guys want to go first? All right, I guess I can go first. (laughs) <laughs> so hi everyone um first of all I want to say thank you to Dr. Angela for having my sister and I on the podcast we're so thankful for the opportunity to get to participate and get to know your audience a little bit better my name is Dr. Diona I am one half of the mental health sisters and it's an organization that my sister Dr. Joe and I started because we noticed that there was a gap in our community especially the African-American and even Caribbean community when it came to receiving mental health services. So we wanted to make sure that we were out there providing not only culturally competent services, but ensuring that everybody has a fair chance at succeeding in life, not just in terms of their mental health, but socially, academically, and so on and so forth. I currently work as a psychologist here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I'm looking forward to getting to talk about my journey with all of you guys. Thank you so much. And next up is your beautiful sister. (laughs) Thank you so much. And thank you for having us once again. My name is Dr. Josie, and I'm the other half of the Mental Health Sisters. Um, My sister pretty much summed up our mission, which is, yes, to get mental health services out there, mostly to the underserved communities, mostly our African-American women, because that's, you know, what we are, Caribbean women, et cetera. Um, My focus is therapy, but I also do neuropsych testing, which basically has to do with um, mostly children dealing with like ADHD, autism, learning disorders, other developmental delays. I try to assess for that and come up with a plan for them to succeed in the school system And like I said, our target audience is mostly those who are minorities and underserved. So I try to get those services available for everyone. Great, great. Well, I I love what you guys are doing. I've been able to catch a few lives. I follow you on your Instagram. And again, I'm a former therapist. Um, I still kind of do a little bit of that um, in my current job as an administrator on campus. But again, mental health advocate. And I love what we're doing collectively in regards to sharing and giving tips and education about mental health. So let's jump right into this because I'm so happy to have both of you. You both are child-free sisters. And I'm just so delighted to just kind of hear your journey and what being child-free looks like for you. So the first question is, I would love to know, what is, how would you describe your life currently? Everything that you guys are doing, you're doing wonderful things. How would you describe your life currently as a child-free African-American, Black, Caribbean woman? Um, Want to take that, Dr. Joe? I guess so. <laughs> so I would describe my life as being more in the hustling mode. So what's happening is I found that I've had more of a career type focus since I don't have a family. Um, I've been working on kind of building other areas in my career Um, when it comes to kind of starting our own practice together. I don't know if we mentioned that kind of sad that we didn't but yes we have a we have a practice together Augusta and Augusta psychology so we're trying to build up our clientele and then on top of that we have our organization the mental health sisters so we're trying to do I would say more 
in terms of outreach when it comes to that organization and kind of just getting information out there, either through social media outlets, attending events, speaking at certain um, engagements. And I feel like that has been most of the focus right now for me, where it's more so trying to build, build, build and get myself in a good place, establish more so as a career woman mm -hmm. and get the message out there. Okay. Okay. And what about you, Diana? How are you, how would you describe your life as a child-free woman today? Is it exciting? Is it boring? Is it kind of, you know, comes and goes? How would you describe it now? Uh, I would say it comes and goes. I definitely agree with Dr. Joe, definitely hustling at the moment. Um, I think that's one of the things about not having kids at this point in time. You have a lot more freedom and liberty to just be, do, make decisions without necessarily having to think about someone else. So I'm more on grinding, building the business, expanding, and then just figuring out life as it comes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, good, good. And so with that being said, I know you, you you both seem like you're on your grind, you're doing your thing, you're career driven. And a lot of times, you know, for some women, it's they look up and they did all of that. And they're like, I'm not married. I don't have any kids. I did all of this. This was the plan. So when you guys think about, you know, building your career and, and building your audience, what, what are your earlier recollections about either warning children or not warning children? And, and I kind of know the answer because you guys kind of shared kind of <laughs> where you see your future. But like, what are your early earlier recollections of like, oh, I want to be a mommy and I play with dolls or I don't want any children right now. Just your thoughts about that. I mean, I would say for myself, I actually, I wasn't the person who thought I want to be a mommy. I was just naturally maternal, maybe because I'm the firstborn daughter in my family. So I would just naturally gravitate towards kids. Of course, Dr. Joe can uh, talk about how often I've bossed her around. Like I just I naturally just got <laughs> into the habit of nurturing, looking out for people. So even though I have that interest in building my career at this point in time i'm still open to children i'm just waiting for the right person because mm. i don't want to have kids with just any person so i'm just waiting and in the meantime i'm getting work done yes yes live that best child free life i get yes. it i get it <laughs> what about you dr joe what are your earlier recollections of either like solidifying that you want to be a mother or being ambivalent or still kind of thinking about it mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually, I, I kind of feel like I went a funny route because, well, maybe others would disagree. When I was younger, I did not want children. I was like, no way, Jose. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> um, and I kind of went through this phase where I was concerned about having kids, not necessarily just because I don't like having children, but more so just the world that we live in, it just didn't seem safe. You know, so I'm the type where I feel like if I have kids, I would worry. So my first inclination was, nope, not happening because I don't like to be in a state where I worry all the time. But then as I got older, and I think this partially has to do with psychology as well, it's almost like coming to accept the limitations that you have and just working within the bounds of what you can control. So not mm -hmm. necessarily being concerned with so many external factors that could vary at any time, but just focusing on you, what you can do, accepting that you have limitations in terms of raising your children and you can raise them in a particular way and try your best to keep them safe, but there's only so much you can do. Mm -hmm. Once I got to the point that I accepted that reality, then it became more feasible for me to have children. And now I'm at the point with uh, Diona where I'm just waiting to meet the right person because I mm -hmm. want to have, you know, the best type of home environment for my kids, um, especially kind of dealing with this group. Um, you probably have some experience with this, but especially when you go into forensic psychology, it can have serious effects on children when the home environment isn't as stable as it should be. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm hearing and picking up that, again, career driven, but I'm also picking up like, I'm not canceling out children, but it has, the setup has to be right, right? I desire right. a partner, um, you know, I don't want to go into it blindly. And I think a lot of women who desire children want that to happen, but find themselves like, oh, I'm 40, I'm 45, I'm 50. So right. with that being said, 
what are your positive and negative experiences about being a child-free woman? So whether that's kind of your work environment, someone asking you to work late because you don't have no one to go home to, or your friend's friend group, are you guys the only child-free sisters in your friend group? So any examples of positive or negative experiences? It's so interesting you say that. As of right now, though, in our friends group, we're not the only ones who are child-free. We're actually all child-free. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, our main friend group where they, everyone is child-free, so we're kind of living our best life. Good. Um, Good. We can. Um, I will say, though, that at work, I have experienced that to the point where I worked at this job that was pretty much you know, take over your life type job, no work-life balance. And they actually would encourage us not to get married or have children so that we could pretty much be workhorses. Wow. At which point I, it just felt like it crossed the, a boundary. But yeah, that I've had that experience as well. With respect to family, I feel like as if they've been kind of on par with how we think and Diona can add her two cents to this, but I feel like they're also in line of having a stable home environment before having children. So it's kind of like they're in agreement with us. I do feel like sometimes parents put the pressure on settling down, mm -hmm. um, maybe without trying to, but um, I definitely think that they're in agreement that before you bring a child into the mix, your home needs to be in a good place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I've talked to some sisters who've had some similar experiences in regards to work you know, and I've had that experience too in regards to like, oh, this person has children, they need to do this, we need to be accommodating. And of course you wanna be a team player, but don't make the assumption that just because I'm single and I don't have children that I wanna work an extra three hours. But right. what, about, what about you? What are your experiences, Diona, in regards to a negative or positive being child-free in the work environment, friend group? Um, I would definitely say the positive part is the freedom. Um, because my sister and I were both very family oriented. So we were always raised under the assumption that once you have kids, you can't make decisions solely based on what you want or what you need. You have to look out for the kids. So the right. fact that right now we are currently child free, it makes it a little bit more liberated in the sense that we get to make our own decisions about where we go, where we travel and what we do. So those are definitely the, the positives. In terms of negatives, yes, I could completely relate with what Dr. Joe was saying, because some people, not only do they act like as if you can give them more time at work just because you're single or you're child free, but also there's almost this sense of you're not a full woman until you're married and have kids. And I feel like that's a very detrimental idea because there are women out there who are not married, who don't have kids either by choice or because they're infertile or whatever else it is. And to me, it's just short-sighted to not view that person as a whole person just because they don't have one or two things that you think they should have. So Definitely. that I would say is the negative that I've noticed. Definitely. Oh, those are facts. Great nuggets, great nuggets. Um, so you guys mentioned that I'm picking up that there hasn't been um, too much pressure from your family, but I know there could be cultural differences um, in regards to there's a lot of emphasis on you get married and you have children. So with your parents and you guys, you being the oldest, youngest and having a younger brother, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, we want grandkids. So is that subtle coming out from your parents or your family? Or is it really like whatever you guys decide we accept? I think because our whole family, at least immediate family, we're all Christian. So we definitely believe marriage comes before kids. So there's not really an emphasis on kids. There is a little implicit pressure about marriage though. So I do feel like as if there's this sense of, <laughs> oh, you know, have you met anybody yet? Are you looking? Are you putting yourself out there and stuff like that? And, you know, but I don't necessarily feel like they're pressuring anybody in my family, parents or otherwise, to have kids. It's more of the marriage, like, hmm, what's going on or mm -hmm. what's not going on? Right. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Joe, do you have something to add? 
Um, I'm in agreement. I feel like you get that pressure, not only from family members, but I guess this taps into culture too, but in our church, because our church is primarily um, composed of our background, which is Haitian. So you get people constantly asking, you know, like, oh, like, so nobody, you're not going to settle down. Oh, this, you know, when are you guys going to, oh, don't wait too late. Or even they'll kind of pressure your timeline. And what I mean is sometimes they'll talk about you getting married, but let's say you don't want to have children right away because I'm the type where I would like to wait a year or two. And they're like, oh, don't wait too long. You don't want to wait too long. Then you can deal with blah, 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 blah. So they're kind of trying to control that narrative a little bit where they kind of give you a timeline and they're like, you should have kids like right away. Whereas I'm more so the type where I like to settle into an adjustment before starting a new adjustment. Mm -hmm. So I want to get time to get acclimated with the person that I'm with, get used to being together, and then kind of solidify that a little bit more before we add a child into the mix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to some sisters and it's interesting, your story is kind of mimicking some some of the, the stories that I've heard before in regards to there's no pressure to have kids but there's a little bit of like, hey, let's move this marriage thing along. And then once you get marriage, it's then the kids. So it's almost like they may not say it, but marriage, most of the time it's like marriage, kids, house, dog. So when you get married and those questions start to pop up of when are you going to have kids? How do you think you guys would, will handle that? What, what will be your responses? You're married, but now it's the pressure of we want grandkids or when are you going to have kids? How do you think you will, will manage that? I think one of the benefits of being in the mental health field is we're always teaching people about boundaries. So that'll be the time where we'll have to set boundaries with well-meaning people and loved ones in our lives. So just getting to the point where we can actually be assertive and say, you know what, I, I know that your heart's in the right place. And I know that you're asking because you wanna see us have kids and you wanna see our, your grandkids or whatever. But at the same time, at this point, that's a decision that my husband and I, we've decided that we want to wait or we want to take, you know, at least a year to just settle and get to know one another. But as soon as we have news, you'll be the first to know. Mm -hmm. Or the second. Yeah. Yep. Or the third. The third. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe fifth. So, <laughs> so, so let's transition into this. I, I, you know, I get that. Um, you know, your cultural background, your, your religious and your faith are really important. And so there's kind of this systematic or plan that you have for yourself. So when it comes to dating, you know, for some child-free women, they have, you know, like, I don't want to date anyone with kids. I don't, I don't, I, I, this is my lifestyle and, and I just don't see kids in it. And then there's some women who are, are flexible. So talk a little bit, if you don't mind sharing about your, your dating experiences. If you met someone that you're really gelling with and they have children or they have little you know, kids under 18, or do you prefer um, 18 and up? So tell me about just your dating um, experiences and just your expectations being a child-free woman. Just speaking for myself, I think that in general, any two people coming together to make a relationship, you're bringing in baggage, whether it's a kid, whether it's past relationships, whether it's trauma, whatever it is, everyone is bringing in some kind of baggage. Um, speaking for myself, when it comes to the age range, I actually love kids. I love kids, you know, 10, three, five, like it, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, I do believe though, that there are certain situations where if a person has kids, it's, there's more complications that comes with it, especially depending on, you know, where the child's other biological parent is, is there drama, you know, like what kind of attitude do they have? Do they co-parent well? Are they combative? Like I do take those types of things into account when I'm making a decision. So I would see it more as a yellow flag where I'd ask questions to kind of figure out what was going on before moving forward. So that's mm -hmm. just how I feel about the whole kids issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of agree along those lines, but I would say that for me, it's not preferred. There have been times where I've talked to someone who did have a child, and sometimes I feel like if it's just one, maybe we can manage, but other times it's more than one and more with, you know, more than one mother. And that makes it very complicated because sometimes you want to make decisions, but it's almost like your parenting strategies have to vary a little bit because maybe that mom doesn't see it the same way that you see it. And then whatever is going on in that household carries over to your household. 
um, things like that. So it can be very tricky to navigate. Um, but in general, it's not my preference. Just from what I said before, I like to kind of make one adjustment and then another adjustment another mm -hmm. as opposed to, I feel like now I'll be adjusting to both, you know, my partner as well as my child at the same time, which I think can get a little bit complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to be an instant mom. <laughs> Because <laughs> some people I know for myself, and I'm similar, where I, I have a preference, I, I prefer not to date anyone with children. But mm -hmm. let's be real, the older you get, the older you get, it's likely I'm likely. 50. Mm -hmm. Many of the people that I meet already have children. Now mm -hmm. I prefer adult children because unlike Dr. D, I, you know, the three-year-old, the seven-year-old, <laughs> the eight, you know, that's you know, but then love is love, right? And so if, if those steps are ordered and that's the vision that God has for you, um, sometimes I might have to put my differences aside. So I right. appreciate you guys Good kind point. of sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. And so in regards to um, thoughts about just child-free women in general, and more specifically African-American Black women, um, do you see us portrayed in media? Like, what are some things that come to mind when we think about how child-free women are portrayed, whether that's a TV show or commercial, what society is kind of marketing? What are some thoughts that come to mind? I definitely think it carries a negative connotation, whether people recognize it or not. It's always seen as your only career focus. Um, so you don't have time for family and you're behind and everyone else is kind of moving on. You need to settle down. Like there's a, there's a negative undertone to it. Usually when I see it in the media, it's not usually something that I feel is celebrated. However, I would say as I'm looking at things on social media now, it looks like it's becoming more acceptable where I've seen, you know, women, um, female entrepreneurs who are kind of getting it in and it's more celebrated than in the past. But if I were to say, okay, let's look back at like, um, even black films, like with black producers, it's always seen as she needs to get a man or whatever it might be, because she's portrayed as this hard woman who doesn't have emotions, who's just career focused and not concerned with settling down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dr. D, what about your thoughts about just media, society, the, those images, the, those marketing tactics, what comes to mind for you? Um, I would say that somewhat I have seen what Dr. Joe mentioned. I've also seen sometimes those women portrayed as like the black auntie, where they're kind of the aunt to everybody in their family or in their community. Um, I've also seen labels put on those women. So for example, you know, that's why no one has wifed you or no one has made you a mother because you're angry and you're sassy and you're this and you're that. So it's, it's kind of like a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation where no matter what, uh, unfortunately, sometimes in the society, they find a way to label Black women in a negative way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And hence why no bibs, burps, bottles exist, because my goal is to highlight beautiful women like yourselves. We're doing um, amazing things. Some of us, you know, we're just kind of career driven. We have a plan where we want to be married, fill in the blank. And there are a lot of women who are just like waiting for the right moment and the right time. And then there are a lot of women who are just like, no, I never want to be a mother, but I could be the best auntie in the world. So I appreciate you guys sharing your views. I want to take advantage of um, the, the background um, in regards to the mental health background. So I'm curious to know, I know women hit me up in, in my DMs about just the pressure they feel from a partner or even from their family. And they're like, do I want kids? Why do I want kids? Why do I want to be a mother? So I'm curious from a psychological perspective, if a woman was to come to you kind of struggling in this area of, I, I, I don't want kids, but I, I think that's what I'm supposed to do. So I might just conform. What, how would you counsel her? What would be some of the things that you would work with her on trying to get her to make the best decision for herself? I mean, I think one starting point, and I'm sure Dr. Joe has plenty more to add, is people pleasing. And that's something that's common, especially in our community, just because whether we recognize it or not, a lot of times Black women get the message that we're not good enough. So we spend a lot of time trying to conform 
to what society or what other people think we should be doing just so that we can fit in, belong and be accepted. So if I felt like as if that person was kind of making this decision, but it was being um, influenced by other people saying that this is what you should be doing, I would wanna get into where does that come from, this people pleasing, this need to conform. Um, and then I would also look at their background because sometimes when a person wants kids, it's not just because they want kids, it's because they have wounds from their past that they're trying to heal. So if I notice that that's another thing that's playing a role, I'll also bring that up in the session so we can talk through it, process you know, their feelings and, and so on and so forth about it so that they can determine for themselves without any outside influences, which decision is right for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah. Joe, how would you work with a woman or sister who's presenting with those type of challenges and just conflicted on what she should do? Yeah, I actually agree, especially with the last part of what Diona said, because one of the things that I see often in therapy is women who actually don't know what they want. They've never explored it. They've been told what to want for most of their lives. And it gets to the point where they can't differentiate between their family's voice and their own. Mm -hmm. So there's a high degree of enmeshment. And one of the things that I've had to do is almost try to find ways to create self-awareness to find out well, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And I think it ties into what Diana was saying about the people pleasing nature of a lot of cultures that we deal with, because like we said, our main um, focus is minority communities. Mm -hmm. So a lot of minority communities come from backgrounds where the family is super important, pleasing the family. You can't just look in terms of yourself. So people sometimes adopt all of these values, but it's not necessarily values that they hold, which is what causes the dissonance where it's mm -hmm. like, I feel like I should want this, but deep down inside, I'm not sure that I do. Does this make me a bad person? Or does this mean that I'm not part of this community? Does this mean that um, racially or ethnically speaking, something's wrong with me that I'm not identifying? Do I not fit in with my family? At which point we kind of clarify for them that you can be a part of your family while also having your own independent, you know, values, belief systems or whatever it might be so that we can tap into those things and make sure that whatever decision they make is in line with their beliefs, their values, their wants, their needs, and not necessarily always reflecting that of the family of origin. Definitely, definitely. Anyone out there listening, if you're in their area and need therapists, they're on point. <laughs> they're on point. <laughs> so I, I want to return back to culture and your culture um, being um, Caribbean women. And so, um, you know, how is it viewed if a woman, I understand that you guys desire to be married and have children possibly in the future, but what happens if a woman does not want children ever, even if she's married, how is that viewed in Haitian culture? I mean, I think it depends. Um, I can't remember, like I wish I could remember, but there is a Haitian Creole term that they'll use whenever a woman is significantly older, unmarried and doesn't have kids. I don't remember the term, but you can tell it's a negative connotation where something is wrong with them, almost mm -hmm. like as if they've been spoiled. And by spoiled, I don't mean spoiled in the sense that they've been given everything they want. I mean, spoiled like a fruit. Effective. Like, mm. exactly. So I know that there's a term like that. So I do know that there are some negative, um, you know, thoughts associated with that. Not saying all of them are negative, but in general, the expectation is once you become an adult, you'll get married, you'll have kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, in regards to possibilities, so not necessarily needing to know specifics, um, medical issues or challenges, but for some women, if, they're, if they desire children and there is maybe a medical barrier, they will consider other options. So I wanted to know just your thoughts um, as you think about your future, thoughts about adoption, um, you know, infertility treatment, just your overall thoughts, especially as you um, think about your own desires to have children in the future. Mm -hmm. Are, are those things that you're open to? 
Um, I'm honestly not sure. I do think I'm open to adoption. I'm not necessarily sure about infertility treatments. Um, and the reason why I say this, and I don't believe it's just specific to me, but I believe it's um, helpful for every woman. I think mentally you have to be in a place where you can handle something like that because it's a lot um, kind of, you know, even hormonally speaking, there's a lot that's being done. And I also think that before you entertain these treatments, there has to be an understanding of you're a whole woman, whether these treatments work or not. Exactly. Otherwise, it can significantly impact you as a person, your self-esteem, your self-confidence coming out if you don't necessarily um, get the outcome that you want. And I know that sometimes when people look at therapists or psychologists, they see it as, oh, well, you must have everything together. But I don't necessarily think that's the case. There are times where we need therapy too. There are times where we need to work through a process, certain things, especially given our background, which kind of makes it seem like you should be able to have children on your very own. And if you don't, something's wrong with you. So I would definitely think in my case, there are certain things that I would have to process um, before undergoing infertility treatments, but I have always been open to adoption. Um, and I think that there's a lot of good kids out there who need a home. So it's not something that's completely off the table for me, but I think it would also depend on my partner's view of adoption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Um, Dr. Diona, how, how are, what are your views about, um, you know, thinking about their future, infertility treatment, foster care, adoption? Um, I'm definitely similarly to Dr. Joe. I am open to adoption. Um, I've actually worked closely with the foster care system at one of my old jobs. It is a lot of work just because those kids have been through so much trauma. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm naturally maternal, I would find myself going over and above the call of duty because I cared so much and I wanted to help them. But in general, I would lean more towards adoption as opposed to foster care. Um, with regards to the fertility treatments, I don't think there's anything wrong with other people wanting to try them. Just speaking for myself as a Christian, I think I would want to talk to my husband and maybe even pray before going down that route because I, and this is just my perspective. I know people may have a different one. I feel like as if God opens and closes the womb. So I would want to pray and kind of have peace about moving forward with fertility treatments or choosing to just go the adoption method instead. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much. And again, I appreciate your narrative and your perspective, knowing that people will have different um, thoughts and, and feelings about what we're talking about today. So there's something that I've been promoting on my Instagram here and there um, in regards to, you know, this, my platform is highlighting African-American child-free women. And so I want to say something to you and I just want to get your feedback. And so you, people will see that I'm African-American black before mm -hmm. they know that I'm child-free. So mm -hmm. what comes up for you when I mention that um, in regards to seeing your identity as a, a brown skinned woman, knowing, knowing that first before knowing at all if you're child-free? Your thoughts about that comment? For me, I think, and this is just the way that I feel, I'm sure other people will see it differently. In our society, being Black, period, there's already a negative attached to that. Being a Black woman, there's another negative attached to that. And it doesn't help the way that we're often either portrayed in the media or the way that we allow ourselves to be portrayed in the media. So when I heard you say that statement, what I was thinking was from the jump, it's already a negative in one way or another. The person may not be aware of the bias or the prejudice that they have, but in general, it's like everyone else is here and then you're a black woman, you're automatically here. Mm -hmm. And then it's as they get to know you, you can kind of either move up or if you do what they think you shouldn't do, you can move down. Mm -hmm. That's my perspective. Good, good. I like that. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Joe? Yes. Along those same lines, I feel like I agree. And it's, it's global. Like it's across the board. Like even in terms of the wage gap, you will have that 
the white woman is making less than the white man, but the black man is making less than both, but the black woman is making less than all three. Like yep. there, it's just, it's something about it that kind of supersedes and colors everything. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we have to be cognizant of. It's something that impacts us across the board. And I also think that might even tap into why sometimes black women feel a little bit more pressure family wise, because it's almost like if we can't be defined in these ways or respected in these ways, maybe we'll be respected as the black mother, because that is something that I do feel has a lot of respect in our community being this strong, Black mm -hmm. woman, the praying mother who never gave up, the one who looked out for all of the family members and kept them together was the glue, et cetera. So it almost does something for you identity or image wise that we can't seem to grasp when it comes to other areas of our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I really um, appreciate and respect your, your perspectives because hence why No Bids Burt's Bottle was formed. And from where I was looking, I didn't see any representation of me and right and so we have this cultural piece of being a brown skinned woman then we I have this cultural piece of being a single brown skinned woman then you add child free and then you add all those other markers and then it's like where do you fall so I really do appreciate um you guys sharing that so as we kind of come to a close we have a couple of more questions um there's often talk of a legacy right you know you get married you have children, you got the house, the picket fence, the dog, you live, you live, leave your money, your prized possessions to your kids. In my case, and in, in many of the sisters that I that I talk to and follow in my Instagram, is that like I don't have kids. So what does that mean? What does that legacy mean? So as today, in today, um, being a child-free woman, what will your legacy be? So thinking like if you don't have children, what will a legacy look like for both of you? So I think one of the things that's important to my sister and I, we've always been about building generational wealth. And when we talk about generational wealth, we don't just mean money. We mean mental health, emotional health, uh, financial health. So we want to make sure that we're leaving a legacy where the people in our family, whether it's our kids or not, they start out on a better foot than we did. Um, so even if I don't necessarily have kids, that's the legacy that I'm hoping to leave for the people around me in my community, whether it's church, work, et cetera. And then with regards to actual material things, I'm the older sibling. I leave everything to Dr. Joe and my brother. <laughs> yes. I, I'm just like, whatever happens, I know it's going to go to a good place. <laughs> Dr. Joe is like, yes. <laughs> God. <laughs> What about you, Dr. Joe? What will be your legacy if you do not have children? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that ours, our, our dreams kind of fall along the same line. I feel like as if, if I did leave a legacy, it would be more so with our organization, the Mental Health Sisters, and hopes that whoever's up and coming will continue that agenda of bringing mental health to the Black community, especially, especially Black women. Um, because I love to see Black women in a place where they know their worth, they know their value, and they feel empowered within that. So that to me would be a dream if we could leave that legacy behind. Um, it's so funny because my sister expects to go first, but we're always each other's beneficiaries. So if anything happens <laughs> <laughs> to me, it goes to her. Um, you know, you're looking at one another. That's good. <laughs> right. So we always end up kind of just sending whatever it is to our siblings. But the other aspect I would also like to leave is, and this taps into what Dr. Diana was saying earlier, was in aspects of um, the church community, because I also feel like as if not only does it help you spiritually, but a lot of our Black um, members of our communities, that's where they get help. They will go to a church mm -hmm. before they come therapist True. so to me it's like it's like I want to invest in that I want to invest in you know the resources that are there for people as well and hopefully even if we're long gone they can still get assistance to build mental health build spiritual health build financial you know wealth like we were discussing before so that as a community you know as a whole we're in a better place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
well, I appreciate the legacy. It seems like you, you guys will be well taken care of. So your, <laughs> Dr. D's stuff will go to you and Dr. Joe, your stuff will go to you. So <laughs> right. out. Everybody wins and, yes. and the brother d- wins too. So, um, so again, th- the goal of our podcast and, and my brand is to really, again, power, empower, celebrate, and highlight. So I'm interested to know what message would you give a young sister who may want to be, who wants to be child free, um, but is pressured from family, a partner or society. So maybe someone who's like 25, who's already determined, I do not want children. What would you say to her? I mean, I think one of the, the main messages that I tell to any of my sisters of color is you have inherent worth that can't be taken away from you. And it's not dependent on any other factor, quality, or characteristic. So you hold on to that when people are trying to pressure you to do things that either you don't want to do or you can't do or for whatever reason, remember that your worth and value doesn't come from those things. Thank you. What about you, Dr. Joe? I definitely agree with that because um, I think a lot of people fail to realize this, but having someone who doesn't really want to have a child bring a child into this world, it could result in other issues that people probably did not anticipate. So I think it's a matter of them sticking to what they know they want. And I would also say, don't be afraid to get help or assistance because sometimes women know what they want, but they're afraid to say it or go after it because of other issues that have yet to be dealt with. So if you need to talk to a therapist to strengthen your resolve or to really help you be on good footing, to improve your self-esteem, self-confidence so that you can walk in line with what you want rather than what society is pressuring you to do then do that like don't be afraid to reach out for that help don't think that you're less than if you have to get that help or you have to work through a few things but just be open to that because sometimes it would be easier for women to stick to what they actually wanted if they truly knew their worth and their value who they are and they work through these little issues that chip away at our self-esteem on a regular basis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So good, so good. And then my last question, and bef- and I'll let you guys kind of share more about how we can follow you and what you're doing. Um, prior to me reaching out to you or you know us following each other on Instagram, were you aware of this child-free lifestyle, child-free empowerment? Were you, a- or were you just like, where is this coming from? So like, did you know that this space existed? Do you understand why it exists? A loaded question, but I'm just curious. I would actually say your social media page opened my eyes to that lifestyle more. Um, Before we started following you, it wasn't something that I even necessarily thought about. But once we followed your page and I started to see your posts, I'm like, oh, okay, like this is like a a unique little community Mm -hmm. that is here that people don't necessarily talk about, but it is here. So it's good to have platforms to kind of support people through that walk of life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I feel like I've seen it um, before, like with other people around me. And like I said, when I was younger, I was like, nope. <laughs> so I kind of used to be on par with it myself, but I've definitely been more exposed to it, you know, since joining your platform, because in recent times, it almost seemed like something that most people still kind of shunned or weren't considering. Um, just because of the fact that society looked down upon it. But one of the things that I've dealt with um, or have come to encounter in my sessions with my clients is how important it is for people to stay true to whatever it is that they believe, think, or feel because not doing so only results in chaos. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Definitely. Ultimately. Yes. Definitely. Well, I'm glad that you guys um, are following and that you um, are embracing this child-free lifestyle now and wherever mm-hmm. God and, and your plan takes you. Um, I, I, I wish you good luck. And I want to make sure that our audience knows the great things that you guys are doing. So please take a moment to share where my audience can follow you, any exciting things on the horizon for Mental Health Sisters. So please shine, sisters, shine. What would you like to share with us? Uh, We definitely have plenty on the horizon for all of uh, our audience. So if you're not already, you can follow our Instagram page at the Mental Health Sisters, that's Sisters, S-I-S, 
T A S. Yes, you know, gotta have the little yep. sass in it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, definitely follow that page. We're going to have lots of new things coming out. And if you follow that page, you'll also see the information for Dr. Joe's IG as mm -hmm. well as my IG. And then a link in our bio is our YouTube page. So if you're not already, please subscribe, share with all of your friends, because we're going to have more YouTube videos coming out in the next few weeks and months. Awesome. Awesome. Dr. Joe, you have anything to add? Um, I feel like she pretty much covered it, but okay. we do have our website as well. There's sometimes people who want to reach out for either coaching or therapy sessions. So therapy, you would go to AugustinPsychology.com and you would be able to fill out a form if you're seeking therapy services. And then for coaching, we do that through the Mental Health Sisters. So you could go to www.TheMentalHealthSisters.com and you'll be able to get those services as well. Thank you. Well, I want to thank both of you, Dr. Joe, Dr. Diona. Thank you guys so much for sharing your child-free journey and your experiences with us. I want to thank everyone who's listening to the podcast. And before I let you go, please remember, womanhood is not synonymous with motherhood. Thank you. Peace. You have been listening to the No Bibs, Burps, Bottles podcast a podcast dedicated to the stories of African-American women without children. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, keep living your best child-free life.